So good morning or good afternoon to you. Welcome to today's session prepare and addressing SDOH integration is not as hard as you think sponsored by the National Association of Community Health Centers. My name is Elizabeth Breidenbach. I'm a meeting and event specialist based in the clinical affairs division here at NAC and I'm pleased to bring you this event along with my division colleagues. Before we get started, I would like to review a few housekeeping announcements. You have joined this online event by either physically calling in or using computer audio. All attendee lines have been muted and will be muted for the duration of this event. The duration of this live event is approximately 60 minutes, including introductions, presentation, and Q&A. Again, the duration of this live event is approximately 60 minutes, including introductions, presentations, and Q&A. Feel free to use the uh, chat box to filter all of your questions. And I want to thank the folks that are online with us. If you submitted questions in advance during registration, thank you for that. We do have that in our back pocket and we do plan on answering some of those questions today at the end of today's session. But if you have questions on your mind, this chat box is going to be open for the duration of this event, located in the lower right hand side of your computer screen. I see people are lively in there right now, um, posing, you know, who they are, you know, what health center they're from and maybe their role. Thank you so much for, for chiming me and we'd love to see and we'd love to hear from you. So again, that box is going to be uh, here for the duration of this live event. Friendly reminders that today's event is being recorded. This session will be available for playback after the event has been completed in about seven to 10 business days. Um, you should have received the PowerPoint slides um, upon logging into the platform, but nonetheless, you will get a link in seven to 10 business days with the slides attached once more and of course, a, a way to view this recording and share it with your colleagues. Um, all, all of your lines have been muted. Again, just make sure you keep that muted on your end. A chat box is open, located in the lower right-hand side of your computer screen. Simply type your comments, questions, or concerns into this box at any time. And we'll have a few polling questions for you today. So we're gonna be super excited to launching one of those very, very soon, which I believe is on the next section. So I'm gonna go ahead and open this poll right now. We wanna know, um, of course, you were in the chat box letting us know about a few details, but um, let us know where are you currently located at? Um, what what section of the, the U.S. are you located at? You should be able to vote on that poll. Again, it should have popped up either on the front of your, oh, I see results are popping in. So we're going to keep that open for about one minute, give or take, and see where everybody swings. Where's everybody coming from? I see West Coast is a very low percentage, which is okay, but I, I wish you guys good morning. Well, yeah, we have, it's 11 o'clock there right now. So uh, a lot of East Coast people are here. So let's go ahead and keep that open for about 30 more seconds. This is kind of a little bit of an icebreaker for you guys just to see where you guys were coming from uh, and see where your colleagues here today are, are coming from. So. Again, 10 more seconds. And let's go ahead and close this guy. Thank you for that. There's going to be another poll later on down the line, and we've got some chat activities for you. At this point, I'm going to turn things over to Eureka, who's going to be uh, setting the stage for you guys, and she has a presentation of her own. Eureka, your line is muted, but um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much and hello to everyone, regardless of where you are in the United States. Thank you for joining us today. Next slide, please. My name's Eureka. Oh, before we get started, just wanted to acknowledge that PREPARE is a long-standing long -standing partnership between APSHO and the Oregon PCA. Um, so we're really excited um, to just be able to be with you all today and just want to represent the long-standing partnership between all these partners with PREPARE. Next slide, please. So good. Good morning and good afternoon. My name is Eureka De La Cruz. I'm the program manager, social drivers of health within the public health priorities division here at NAC. Um, next slide, please. And I'm joined by a colleague of mine at Affinia Healthcare, Sonia Deal. So I'll be introducing her later on, but we wanted to um, have a moment to just launch the next polls if we can. And we wanted to get a sense of if your health center is currently um, collecting SUH data, and if so, which standardized screening tool are you using? So if we can launch that slide, that would be, or the polls, that would be great. Give me one minute, Eureka, it just oh. froze for a second. Of course, technology. <laughs> That's okay. Poor technology needs a break. <laughs> <laughs> So while we get the polls launched, we'll just go ahead and move on to the next slide. I, I want to be cognizant of time and, and let you all have enough time with Sonia, who's our, our subject matter expert for today's session. Um, so why are we talking about the social drivers of health? Um, 
it's something that has been coming up a lot within um, our society today in terms of being able to really understand what impacts a per person's health. Um, and one of the first key steps to really understanding the social needs of our patients is understanding, you know, the data that we have that that we're able to collect on them. So these are just some definitions that we use interchangeably with um, within the field of health equity. First, we have social drivers of health. And these are the conditions in which people play. They're born, grow, live, work, age, and play, as I like to say. And these conditions are shaped by the distribution of money, power, and resources. A lot of times social drivers of health or social determinants of health, um, SDOH are interchanged. The term is interchanged with social risk factors. They're different. Everybody has social drivers of health. Um, so just wanted to make sure that we were cognizant of that de definition. Now, social risk, risk factors are the adverse conditions that are associated with poor health and that are related to social drivers of health. And then we have social needs. And these are some of the needs that we, we identify with our patients. And really, um, it's, our, it's our duty with our patients to really partner with them to see what, what, um, what are the needs that are most um, important to them in terms of uh, addressing. Because sometimes a lot of patients will come in, they have a lot of needs, but you'd be surprised. Sometimes they just want to address one or two of them. And then the last term is population health. And really this is understanding the health outcomes of a group of individuals, or as I like to say, um, understanding our patient population and wrapping our arms around them so we provide them with as much care as possible. So I know the second poll has probably gone up. So if you're using a standardized screener, please let us know which one you're using. We love to know, um, you know what, what uh, tools you all are using. Next slide, please. All right, so the social drivers of health. So as I mentioned earlier, these are all the conditions that work together, right? On the left-hand side, we have um, we have upstream and downstream. What do I mean by that? Um, downstream is what we see in the day-to-day. -day. So that's the behaviors of a patient or ourselves, the health conditions and the health outcomes. But all of these factors are, are informed by upstream conditions, such as socioeconomic conditions, environmental conditions, institutional power and social networks. And by social networks, I don't mean social media. I <laughs> just want to be clear. I want to clarify with that. So all of these work together and they the one influences the other. And it's the cyclical um, relationship that we see between upstream and downstream efforts. And one of the reasons our team uh, has switched to the term social drivers of health is because drivers lets us it lets us acknowledge the fact that um, these are conditions that we can change, right? Determinants seemed a little bit final, like it's it's steady, not steady, but it's it's um, it's impermeable or you can't do anything about it. Whereas drivers, we want to be able to affect that. So in this slide, you see on the right hand side, all of the different contributors to a person's health. And really, in summary, 80% of a person's health is impacted by social drivers of health. Um, and you'll see in this in this graphic here how it all breaks down on each of the levels. So when we think about a person's health, only 20% of it is really impacted or informed by healthcare explicitly, but really all these other factors is, um, are at play. Next slide, please. So when it comes to building the capacity, um, you know, in terms of responding to social drivers of health, these are just some of the questions or some of the buckets of, of items that we need to think about. So we need to think about the people who are the staff, who are the, what are the different roles that you have in your organization that could help respond to social drivers of health needs. The next part is processes. And processes is, is a really important piece to consider because what your current workflow looks like, you want to be able to, to adapt that. You don't want to uh, necessarily upend everything and just start from scratch. We want to build upon what you're currently working on and make some edits or, or adjustments, if you will. And then technology, this is really where it all comes together. And what I like to say in terms of technology is that it combines your offline practices and people and it converts it to online. So really focus on the people and the processes, get that squared away and then think about technology. Sometimes you're able to do it together, but sometimes it's good to kind of take a step-by-step -step approach. Next slide, please. So here on this slide, we have the different reasons why we should be collecting standardized data on the social drivers of health. And really, this is powerful data. Health centers and others are really increasing their use of social risk screening tools, such as PREPARE, and they're doing so to better understand, document, and understand the root causes of not just poor health, but also inequities. 
So having this data integrated into systems can allow teams to internally and externally collaborate. And really, they're able to ha have this ability to proactively assess and address a person's social needs. And it could be, and it could also be used to guide local partnerships as well as accelerate alignment. So this diagram really provides examples of use cases at each of the different levels in terms of how you use this data. Um, so while maybe some of you are in the in the health centers and maybe you're working individually with patients, you have a set of data that's important to you. But guess what? That that data is important at all these different levels. So it may seem like an extra step and it is and we acknowledge that that this is extra work however it's a long-term investment in the health of your community next slide please so when we talk about social drivers of health and really improving health equity uh, one of the, the tools that i'm really privileged to talk about is prepare it's a protocol for responding to and assessing a patient's assets risks and experiences and this this was created back in 2013 between NAC, APSHO, and OPCA, as well as the Institute for Alternative Futures, although they no longer exist. Um, and really, the, what, what, what prompted this effort was an understanding or really an acknowledgement of the fact that health centers serve patients that have a lot of needs. And how do we really understand the level of patient complexity within our health center populations? But also, how do we make sure that the systems around in our, in our local area, in our state, and federally can support health center patients to really live better and healthier lives. Next slide. So when we talk about prepare, what does it what does it measure, right? So these are the core measures. On the left hand side, you'll see the elements that are highlighted or, or outlined in red. Those are elements that are aligned with UDS, and we're really proud of that and the fact of really being intentional to make sure that it's aligned with UDS as well as other uh, measuring options. And then we on the other on the other side of the core measures, you have the other elements as well. And then we have on the right hand side of the slide optional measures um, with prepare. Now the difference between core and optional is not necessarily um, core whether or not to ask them is core of what we should know about a patient. So if some of these elements look familiar or they're already being collected in your system, that's great. There's no need to reinvent the wheel and add another question. What we what we said as a prepare team is that this is this is core information for us to know about our patients. And then the optional are like the the nice to haves or or additional information that we should know about our patients. But then at the end of the day, it's all relevant. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we're really proud of in terms of prepare is that you know, we the, the team that created this really made sure that it was a, a useful tool and really worked with health center pilot sites as well as other stakeholders to create the protocol. So it's actionable being that we are able to collect this data and actually do something with that data at the patient level all the way to the payment level. The next piece is that it is standardized and widely used. Again, um, really trying to understand that it's not so much the wording and the the it's, it's really about what elements are we thinking about or are we understanding about our patients? That's what's standardized. A lot of times people get tripped up over having to ask the questions as is. Prepare is flexible enough that you can, you can really meet your patients where they're at and maybe rephrase the question. But at the end of the day, we're asking pretty much the same measures, if you will. And it is widely used, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Like I said earlier, it is stakeholder driven. So we've always engaged our, our health centers to help us inform the use of prepare and make any sort of changes. But it's also evidence based. The team that created this really went through an extensive literature search to make sure to see what were the best um, the best measures to capture, but also to see what else was out there. We've seen that it has been designed and it has allowed um, different health centers and also primary care associations and health center control networks to accelerate sy systemic change in their area. So that's something that we're really proud of. And finally, like I mentioned earlier, it's patient centric. And that's something that's really important to the team is that there's enough flexibility to really meet patients where they're at. If you need to rephrase a question, that's great. And believe it or not, a lot of times patients say that they like being asked these questions. It, you may have to provide context as to why, but a lot of times it's it's important information that they sometimes want to share with their care teams. Now, in the next slide, these are just some opportunities to leverage prepare. I'm not going to go through all of them, but really prepare allows you to set yourself up for all of these different opportunities to and ensure that your health center is is well positioned to meet the needs of your community. 
Next slide. So one thing that we're really proud of is that uh, according to UDS data from 2020, PREPARE is the most dominant standardized screening tool um, that's used by health centers. So, and we were really surprised to see that, especially given the impact of the pandemic through 2020, that there were still health centers that they did what they had to, to collect this information and to really identify the needs of their patients. And so we wanna acknowledge that great effort. And just, again, just acknowledge the fact that it is a widely used tool. On the next slide, we'll see that, oh, I had the, the, the markers there. On the next slide, we have a map um, just to show the difference in usage. The, the one on the left-hand side is 2019. The one on the right is 2020. So again, we're really happy that there's been an uptick in the use of PREPARE. Next slide. So I'm just gonna go through just a couple tips. I'm not gonna go into too much detail because we'll hear a lot from Sonia and she's got some great um, experience and tips and resources to share with you all. But if you're new to prepare or even SUH screening, these are just some action, action steps to engage your st stakeholders. And this is a really important tool be or process because you wanna make sure that you, that you get the why across to all of your teams from your staff to your board members to patients and even community partners. And these are just some of the steps that you can do to engage your stakeholders. And on the next slide, we'll see just some of the common challenges and messaging solutions that we have. Um, oh wait, that I kind of, um, <laughs> that's okay, we'll stay right here. So on this slide here, we have the five rights framework. And this is just a really great framework to, to really understand What's the best workflow for your health center? Um, so in the prepare toolkit, you'll see there's more information on the five rights framework, as well as the different types of workflow considerations. And when you go through this process, it'll take you through different questions. And at the end, you'll be able to understand what's the best place for you to start at. And on the next slide, these are just some examples of workflow models and really um, one of the things that we've heard from all of our centers is this is really no wrong approach. Um, you can you can have health. We do have health centers that pretty much anyone and everyone at the health center will ask the questions to the patient. But then we have other health centers that will use either non clinical staff, such as community health workers or patient navigators, or we have clinical staff that will ask it during the question during the visit, and so on and so forth. And then we also have health centers that have reported that they've been able to use either the patient portal or a tablet or a kiosk to ask these questions, or even um, a paper form. And I know I've seen practices before in the past where they laminate it and they have the patient complete it and then they return it to the MA and then they translate that all into the EMR. Obviously it depends on your workflow, but really anyone is really able to ask these questions. So next slide. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Sonia Deal. She is the Assistant Vice President of Clinical Integration at Affinia Healthcare, which is in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, Sonia, I can't thank you enough for joining us today and I hand things over to you. Thank you, Eureka, for that introduction. Um, I do want to start by thanking NAC for allowing me to share our practices on this platform. And I also want to thank everyone who is joining us live and for those who will see us on the replay. Next slide. Um, so today we will discuss how Affinia Healthcare integrated the prepare tool into practice, how we use the data to focus on to focus our efforts in building partnerships and community collab collaborations. And we will also discuss um, how we built community referrals to address social determinants of health. So on this slide, you'll see that Affinia Healthcare, this just provides some information about Affinia Healthcare. Uh, we have 11 sites that include five health centers. Um, in those health centers, we have internal medicine, uh, pediatrics, women's health, uh, family practice, audiology, optometry, and a host of other services and departments. Uh, we also have three health centers that Im are embedded in schools. And we, are, we also have a partnership with MOSDO, which is the Missouri School of Dental and Oral Health um, and AT Steele University. And that is in operation of a 92 dental chair operatory. Next slide. So this is just uh, another poll that I wanted to um, get an idea of how many organizations on the webinar have employed community health workers. And while you are completing that poll, um, in order, okay, there you go. <laughs> 
So have you employed community health workers or are you intending on employing community health workers? And we'll go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, this slide provides a little bit of information in regards to the Community Health Worker Initiative at Athenia Healthcare. Uh, we received our first grant to implement CHWs in 2017, and we started with the integration of community health workers in our, in our maternal child and chronic disease departments. Uh, once those CHWs were embedded and trained, we implemented the prepare tool into our nurse prenatal appointments and our chronic disease education class. As you can see by this slide, our community health workers uh, have grown and we now have a lead community health, excuse me, a lead community health worker manager and a team of seven CHWs. And we are actually um, in the process of hiring five more CHWs. A few of the departments that they are integrated into are maternal child, um, chronic disease, our HIV initiative, um, our COVID and immunization clinic and uh, substance abuse and our behavioral health partnerships and a few other um, areas as well. Next slide. So I wanted us to take some time today to uh, watch portions of a of how the prepare tool has been implemented into our prenatal practice. So we're going to watch snippets of an actual um, interview and a link to the full interview will be provided by NAC. Oops. Oops. Technology. <laughs> there we go. Good afternoon, Ms. Candy Lynn. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. So I wanted to touch bases with you. Now that you have gone through the prenatal intake process, I wanted to review your prepare tool to see if there's anything that we could help you with. Is that okay? okay. That's fine. Okay. So I'm going to share your tool. Let me find it. Okay. So are you able to see your prepare tool? Yes, I'm able to see it. Okay. So I just want to go over some of the questions, or I want to go over the questions on your prepare tool today to see how we can best help you um, and help get, get you ready for your baby. So are you excited? Um, a little bit. I'm a little nervous, but overall, I think I'm excited. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So it's siblings. I have three siblings that stay there and my mother and a friend. Okay, okay. So are you prepared for when baby comes home? Do you know where baby will sleep? I haven't really thought about that. Okay. Okay. And mom feels that it's okay that baby comes. Mom's excited for baby to come home as well? Yes. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So um, do you know if you, so I see you have housing. Uh, do you know if you'll be looking for your own place soon? Or, you know, again, mom says it's okay for you and baby to stay for as long as you would like. I would like to look for my own place. I just don't know exactly like where I would be able to look as far as the housing situation right now. So would you be able to assist me with housing? Absolutely. We can, we can definitely look into um, different things. Uh, we can look at your income to see what type of housing you might be eligible for as well. So, um, you know, that's something that we are when we are looking at the prepare tool, we'll look further into that, okay? Okay. All right. So,
with the St. Louis Public Housing Authority. And we can definitely um, have a conversation with them or one of the representatives there to see uh, what they might be able to do to it. And uh, we are also connected with a few other uh, resources for finding housing. So we can definitely take a look um, to make sure that we meet the needs, uh, meet your needs, okay? All right. So I'm going to go over the money and resources. And um, sometimes this, these subjects can be a little touchy or um, just a little uncomfortable to talk about. So um, I want to let you know that um, what we talk about is um, you can be confident that I will share it only with the people who need to know. And um, as long as there's no situations that are putting you and baby in danger, uh, you know, this will be something that we will work on. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as far as your schooling, um, you said you choose not to answer this question. Um, are you looking to further your education at all? Not right now. Not right now. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. Um, and your current work situation are you working temporary or part-time yeah it's temporary work okay it's temporary work okay and so um that's that type of work that you do that's temporary do you mind if i ask yes it's just custodial and i just i'm just doing it right now until i get further along in my pregnancy and then i'll just take my maternity leave and then when i'm on my maternity leave i plan on trying to find me a, a full-time job Okay, okay. So do you know what field you would like to go into? Like, do you like the medical field? Do you like, um, you know, administrative, you know, receptionist? I like the medical field. You like the medical field? Okay, okay. Um, have you ever looked into any medical classes? Mm, I have not. Okay, okay. Um, do you mind? I'm going to go back to your school for a minute. Do you mind if I ask you what's the highest grade that you've completed? I graduated from high school. Okay, okay. Um, are you still in touch with some of your high school counselors? No. Okay, okay. And the reason why I ask because there are tech schools that will, um, there are tech schools in the area that will actually uh, send you to school for different medical um, certificates like a certified nurse's assistant, a medical assistant. And, um, and so that was one of the reasons why I asked. Uh, we can definitely see about getting you connected to one of the counselors to maybe talk about what that possibly would look like for you. And um, if you could possibly shadow, if you have time to shadow in the medical field to see if that is something that you're um, actually wanting to get into. Does that sound good? That sounds good. So when you say connect, are you meaning like to connect me with a person or? And it asked in the past year, have you or any of your family members that you live with been unable to get the following when, you, when it was really needed. And so you circled yes for food, utilities, medicine, um, and medicine. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, so are you on any um, type of SNAP benefits, EBT? No, uh, what's that? So that's the food stamps. Oh, no. Okay. Okay. So we can definitely work on making sure that we fill out a food stamp card, um, a food stamp appointment for you today, a application, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and utilities, um, are you, and, and this may be a little bit of a sensitive question, but, um, but it is an important question. Um, for the utilities, are you, um, do you know if there are any disconnection notices at home? Um, I heard my mom say that she had a disconnection notice, but they haven't came to turn our lights off yet. Okay. Do you think mom would be willing to share that information uh, with us? 
so that we may be able to get her some help? I'm not sure, but I'll ask her to see. Okay. And, and sometimes um, our family members, it, it can be a little um, embarrassing or, you know, we don't want to make mom angry. Uh, but I can also share the information with you. We have the Urban League of St. Louis that helps pay for utilities. And we have a few other organizations that helps pay utilities. And even if mom is behind on rent and things, um, we can, I can share that information with you, uh, but it's going to be important for mom to share the information so that we can um, assist you guys as soon as possible. Okay. Can you give me the information and I take it home to let her see and then if she wants to um, fill it out, can I bring it back to you or? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that would be fine. So I can print off um, I can print off a brochure and information and some of the flyers that we have for utility assistance. And then um, you can take it home with you with the application and it's, it's interested. You can, fill, you can fill that out and bring it back. But there will be certain things that will definitely be needed. Um, so we just want to make mom aware of that. Okay. And, and it also depends on, you know, who's on the bill, uh, whose name the bill is in. So we, um, again, you know, we can help with that as much as we can. Okay. And also, um, I want to go back to 14 for just a minute. I know that you, you know, we're preparing for baby. So I was thinking, um, do you have a sleep arrangements for the baby. Do you have somewhere for baby to sleep? No. No? Okay. Okay. So at your next appointment, I'll meet you there. And uh, what we'll do, what I'll do is I'll schedule a cab ride home for you and I'll follow that cab home if it's okay with mom. And we'll get you set up for safe sleep education and then also get you set up uh, with a... Um, Oh gosh, with a uh, pack and play. Okay, and that will that will help for babies to have a safe sleep a safe sleep environment. Is that something that I would have to pay for, or it's it's completely free to you? It is completely free. We also have our diaper program, so I'll make sure that I bring that application at your next appointment, and we'll complete that application together, and I will bring you. Um, a set of diapers for your first appointment and every appointment thereafter, you will be able to get diapers, even though you haven't delivered yet. We wanna make sure you get stocked up for baby. And then after baby has come, then uh, you will get two packs of diapers. Okay, so that'll be, a, that'll be the equivalent of about, of about 50 diapers per month. And I can get those every month in my appointments? Yes, yes okay. ma'am. Okay, that's fair. So if you ever feel like you don't have someone to talk to or you uh, need someone to talk to and you can't find anyone, um, you, can always, you can always call me. You have my information. Um, we're, we're definitely going to be bonded over the next few months. And so um, you can contact me uh, we also have a behavioral health department, and I know that there's sometimes, um, you know, a stigma on mental health, but mental health for you is very important, um, as well as, you know, your ability to manage stress, especially because you're pregnant, and everything that you feel, the baby also feels. So we want to make sure that we support you as well. So if you have a need, um, to speak with someone, you can always let me know. Like I said, you can call me and I can get you connected um, and introduce you to one of our BHCs, our behavioral health consultants in the facility. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Candyland, I am very um, honored and glad to meet you. And I'm very um, excited about this, this next journey in your life and being a part of that with you. Um, you have my information. 
please feel free to give me a call. Um, any question, no question is, you know, is um, a dumb question. It, you can ask me anything. Uh, we will get you set up for our babies, um, ba basic baby <laughs> teaching education classes. And Thank you so much. So this interview was, is a depiction of how we have integrated the prepare tool into care for our prenatal patients. Um, this process does look different in our chronic disease education classes, uh, but nonetheless, we do use the prepare tool in those as well. Uh, the patient in this interview is Athenia Healthcare's very own lead community health, man, community health worker manager. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Miss Candace Henderson, and I believe she is on here somewhere. Uh, this is Candace graduating from the CHW course. She has been very instrumental in building the CHW program at Affinia Healthcare and has uh, just a unique passion for community and building community partners. Next slide, please. Uh, this next portion of my presentation will be dedicated to in, um, incorporation of data from the prepare tool and how we focused on building community partners as well as referrals. Um, the prepare tool is integrated into our electronic health record. Um, I'm not going to read the slides to save time, but the slides are being provided. Uh, so on this slide, you can see that uh, the different organizations in St. Louis that we are partnered with. Uh, this, of course, is not an all-inclusive list of partners. Uh, there are several partners or several organizations we've worked with that actually provide multiple services for our patients. And we also provide services to uh, the external organizations as well. Um, I do want to highlight on this slide the medical legal partnership. Um, that was um, how we were addressing legal issues, especially with our maternal uh, maternal child department and our prenatal patients, uh, patients that were experiencing legal issues if they were pregnant. Um, this was a part of a grant with the Legal Services of Eastern Missouri. Uh, we actually built a referral for them in our EMR that would allow us to be able to send them an electronic referral. Um, we do have some refer referrals built electronically in, into, our, into our EMR. Uh, we've worked with our IT team to build these systems. Also, we do have some internal departments. So if you look at insurance, we do have an internal department, our outreach team that assists patients with addressing insurance needs. Next slide. So uh, these are a few of the pictures um, from the work that we've done around um, SDOH as well as with the community health workers. Um, this is Candace and myself picking up our very first load of diapers for our patient. Uh, we had to rent a U-Haul. Um, we had over 40,000 diapers. And the, the other picture is um, how the maternal child department set up different um, activities and events and provided diapers and other snacks and resources. This was the kickoff to um, enrolling patients in our diaper program. Um, so before the pandemic, we, we implemented a diaper program through St. Louis Diaper Bank to provide diapers to our patients. Um, during the pandemic, we actually were able to work with St. Louis Diaper Bank and provide uh, emergency diapers to the community at large. Next slide, please. Um, so this is the first time we, these are pictures of the first time we implemented the prepare tool at a community event. Um, this, these pictures are of St. Louis's largest and oldest public housing community. Uh, we implemented the prepare tool to identify needs of the community. And we also worked with the public housing authority to couple it with a community and health needs assessment. We wanted to um, obtain a whole picture of the community needs and um, it was very, very beneficial to, to obtain this information. So this is the team um, at Kids Corner. We actually had children, um, they were welcome and we had a team there to, um, to do community um, 
activities with the children and then our tables where everyone came together um, and to sign in. Next slide, please. Um, so these pictures are from our wel Welcome to Pregnancy event. Uh, we had our outreach team, departments, uh, WIC, our maternal child departments and other outside vendors that partic participated in this event. And we invited those uh, women that were new to pregnancy or um, that, were, um, that were just going through our prenatal process. Uh, the other picture is from the Hypertension Education Group. And this is Operation Food Search doing a cooking class at one of those classes. Next slide. So on this slide, we, um, we also partnered with other organizations before and during the pandemic to provide fresh produce. Um, this slide just gives um, information of the various partnerships that we have. Um, during the pandemic, every week we provided uh, food, um, free food to the community. Um, people would just have to have transportation. If they were walking up, they were, would be able to receive food bags as well. Um, and this, again, happens um, happened during the pandemic, before, and we're still doing food, uh, fresh food delivery. Next slide, please. So this is the Metro Market Bus. Uh, we are very, we've been very excited always about uh, the St. Louis Metro Market Bus. Um, this is a Metro bus that is outfitted as a fresh produce stand. And in the next slide, you'll see pictures of people, uh, the inside of the bus. Uh, we actually have uh, brought this bus to our chronic disease education classes. So hypertension education, when those classes are going on, the Metro bus is on site to provide those classes. And the Metro market has also provided fresh food bags through other grant funding um, that was free of charge for those who were um, a part of our chronic disease education classes. Next slide. Again, yet another partner for Athenia Healthcare uh, for combating food insecurity, we have done cooking classes at operation, uh, with Operation Food Search at Athenia Healthcare. And even during the pandemic, we had um, a six week course where we provided, the, um, we provided the ingredients for whatever was being taught. And we went, vir we went live virtually for the actual class. And then the community health workers delivered the, the bags of food and fresh produce to those uh, members who participated in the classes. Next slide. Again, I'm not going to read the slides, but how we uh, this is how we have addressed housing and transportation issues. These are a few of the partners uh, that the organizations that we're partnered with to address housing. Uh, for transportation, this is an internal process for us. We actually have um, cab vouchers. Through other grant funding, we've been able to provide bus tickets, um, and sometimes we will also provide Uber rides. And so that's something that we are, um, uh, again, addressing transportation for our patients. Next slide. So this slide is addressing the medical and mental health needs of um, the patients at Athenia Healthcare. We have um, partners that are both internal and external for uh, medical needs. We have, um, oh gosh, services that include uh, providers who provide holistic health. Uh, we have audiology, optometry. We have our chronic disease management team. Uh, we have a case management team. And uh, we, of course, have our community health workers that uh, we make sure we are implementing into every facet of our practice to make sure that we're addressing the needs of our patients. Next slide. 
And so this is, again, just a picture of one of the patients. And she's actually our patient champion for hypertension. Um, she went through the class, and I'm going to tell a brief story here. Um, this patient, her blood pressure was, you know, very high when she came to us. And um, she went through our six-week hypertension education course. By week five, her blood pressure was um, slightly above normal range, but definitely out of the uh, crisis range. And um, she, you know, talked to patients in the health centers and in the community about our hypertension education class. And she actually um, did a commercial with us and uh, became the uh the champion, the patient champion for the hypertension education class. Next slide. So these are some of the challenges that we've had. Um, of course, with supply and demand, one of the biggest issues was housing and it still is. Um, of course there, and I'm sure in our state, in every other state, housing is a very big issue for um, for a lot of different areas. Um, so supply versus demand, not enough resources. Um, the staff are sometimes uncomfortable asking the questions because they feel that the, the questions are intrusive, uh, which is why we've done some education to really try to break uh, the prepare tool down into a conversation. And then um, patients are uncomfortable answering questions because uh, we've seen the mistrust of the medical system and of the legal system. And, you know, we've, um, you know, heard stories of community health workers, you know, um, being able to break the barriers. Next slide. So some of the successes, I will say throughout the pandemic, our CHWs kicked into high gear. Um, I'm not going to read the slide verbatim, but we've served um, over 10,000 community members with um, diapers, and we've actually given out more than 150,000 diapers during the pandemic. Um, we consistently had community health workers that provided food, um, uh, food distribution to over 10,000 community members. We, even though we were um, not able to bring some patients into the health center, we were able to provide virtual uh, pregnancy education and, as well as virtual chronic disease education. Next slide. Um, so the pearls, what I wanna highlight on this slide is the prepare tool. Um, we don't think of it as 20 questions and we still, you know, there are some that are um, very intimidated by the prepare tool, but we break it down into more of a conversation. Uh, we want to make sure that we're making that patient comfortable. Um, so I would say definitely have more than one way to ask a question. Um, sometimes if the patient doesn't understand, changing the wording can help. Um, knowing the, um, know your audience. So if you have a person that, you know, you're using certain words in a cu different culture, it may mean something different. So just make sure that you know your audience. And uh, main, the main pearl is uh, we are actually working on integrating the prepare tool into our entire organization. And so uh, one of the things that we are doing is having all departments involved in that. Um, the team approach is always the best approach. Next slide. I wanted to leave some time for questions and answers, but this is part of my team. Um, I, I am very um, honored to actually be with them. And the shirt that they have on says, I love what I do and it shows. So I will give this, uh, give the, Slide, give it back to Liz. Thank you. Hey, Yuriko, did you want to uh, briefly talk about these resources before we go into our Q&A? Yes, just very quickly because we've got some great questions that we want to get to. So these are just some resources I didn't get a chance to go into, but these are all linked in the slide deck. There's a lot of great resources within the toolkit itself, but as well as our website. So there's a little bit of something for everyone. <laughs> so if you go here, uh, check any of these links out. You'll be able to find those resources. On the next slide, 
wanted to just share a little bit about um, a survey that we're currently doing. And we really want to get, get from the field what's happening in terms of a screening, SUA screening during COVID. And so we this is the third iteration of the survey. And probably the three most important things about the survey that are new is we really want to understand how are folks assessing and addressing SUH needs within special and vulnerable populations, think racial and ethnic groups, as well as other individuals or communities that are structurally margina marginalized. Um, we also want to understand in terms of uh, funding, uh, how, are, uh, how are you all using funding from the American Rescue Plan Act to address SUH? And then as we come out of this pandemic, not sure, <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of implications on health centers um, in terms of once the public health emergency declarations expired. So we wanna hear from you all in terms of what comes top of mind, and hopefully you all get a chance to complete that survey if you haven't done so already. Um, and then the next slide, we're really excited to talk about, um, I'm really excited to share on the next slide, um, a new opportunity for everyone. Um, this is open to everyone, regardless, this is not prepared specific. Um, it's our health equity community of practice. It is funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation mm -hmm. and is really going to go through um, th seven different episodes of Unnatural Causes. It's a PBS documentary series. We're going to go through a lot of different um, policies and just different historical context of, of what's Im impacting people's health. So our next session, our first session is on May 18th. However, we've created the community practice to be both online and offline. So, you know, if you want to learn more about it, check out the website. And so now we'll go ahead and go to um, Q&A. So at this point, I know we had quite a few questions in the chat, so I pulled them out. And I wanted to just ask these to um, to Sonia, who did a phenomenal job, by the way. <laughs> and I've always, always, I presented with her. I think probably four times at this point. I always learn something new, and I can't, I can't appreciate you all so much for for all the work that you do. Thank so you. I was curious, um, what curriculum did you all use for training CHWs? So we actually um, utilize a the local community college, and they use the Community Health Workers uh, Foundation. Um, it is an actual curriculum that is approved by the state of Missouri. Great. And I know in other states, they have area health education centers, AHECs. So a lot of times some states do uh, trainings for CHWs there, and that's typically a certification as well. But I've also yeah. heard of other community colleges having CHW programs, and they're growing more and more um, by the by the month, I'd say, and also there's the National Association of Community Health Workers. Um, they're 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 a young organization, but they're really trying to convene all the different efforts around CHWs. Yes. So, can you talk a little bit about how the CHWs are currently funded at the health center? And kind of in addition to that question, someone else had kind of add, added to that. You know, is it purely grant funding, or there or are there alternative sources of funding for the work that they do? Sure. So for all of the community health workers that are employed at Affinia Healthcare, it is through grant funding. Um, however, we are working with the coalition, the CHW coalition in Missouri, um, as well as with the National Association of Community Health Workers to, um, to really advocate for uh, reimbursement for CHW services. We're not there yet, but we are. Um, there are a lot of organizations that are working on um, CHWs being be able to be reimbursed uh, for services. Um, as for funding, again, all of our CHWs, uh, they are funded through grants. Yeah. And I know I've heard of North Carolina, they use the 1115 waiver program. Um, that's more, I think that's a demonstration through Medicaid. I'm not sure. Um, but our team, the public health priorities team, we're trying to do more around funding and reimbursement for CHW. So definitely stay tuned and, and stay you know connected on that. Um, all right. So the next question is, how long do you plan for each of the prepare screening interviews? So um, it really depends. Um, in our chronic disease education programming, they uh, they actually have integrated the prepare tool in the very first session, and so we have uh, we've allotted thirty minutes um, for the prepare tool to be completed. And if there's someone who's having trouble reading the prepare tool, generally it is by paper. But if there's someone having trouble reading the prepare tool, we will sit down side by side and assist them with that. 
Um, again, some of the wording, um, some of the questions, the way we ask them, we get the same result, um, but the, the patient may not understand the question. So generally it's about 30 minutes in, in clinic. Yeah, and I know there's some health centers that do it in phases, but it depends on your EMR and your workflow. So really, you know, it's however you want to do it. But yeah, yeah it's a long, it's a long screening, so we do acknowledge that. Yeah, but we keep hearing from health centers that it's really helpful information to have. So it's worth the investment, if you will. Absolutely, and we also have, as I stated before, we have the prepare tool integrated into our EHR. And uh, so a lot of that demographic information we're able to skip because it's already present. Yeah. Um, there was a question that just got dropped in the chat and I wanted to ask this to you first before I go on to the next question. So how do you enter the screening tool outside of the clinic, but clinical visit? So we have done it a few ways. Uh, the initial, when we initially uh, implemented the community health workers into uh, practice. We actually had them with tablets and we created the prepare tool on the Qualtrics platform as a um, so that they would be able to do the prepare tool out in the community. When we had the community event at the public housing um, community, we actually did that with paper and then we came back to the health center and implemented our um, put it into Qualtrics and then was able to gather that information. Yeah. And then someone asked, do you enter the, the results into the EHR or just purely Qualtrics? So we actually put it into our EHR. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think a lot of um, what I've seen from other health centers is um, they'll have someone, let's say the MA, maybe during the clinical visit that they'll, as the provider or the clinicians with the patient, they'll you know, they put in the, the information, but it depends. And you kind of have to, you know, do a quick pilot of that to see how it works, learn from it, and just keep refining the process as you go. Yes. All right. Um, Eureka, before we go into the next question, it is 2.57, um, folks. Uh, we're going to actually stay on just for a few additional moments, just to, or minutes, I'm sorry, to answer just a few additional questions past the 3 o'clock hour. Again, this event is being recorded, so if you do need to jump off, completely understand. But if you would like to stay online with us and hear the responses live, we'd love to have you. Ryuko, take it away. Thank you, Elizabeth. All right, so the next question, it's probably for me, but I'll ask it and answer. And if Sonia, you can add to it, then, then that'd be great. Okay. So someone had asked that they would be interested in learning if, if anyone has been using um, Z codes for billing within the office visits and if they mm -hmm. share that information with payers as part of, um, you know, in terms of letting them understand what's happening with SDOH within the, within the health centers. Um, we do know of some health centers that are doing that. It's, I'd say it's a big lift. Um, it depends on the EMR, the EHR, if it's already coded on the back end. Um, we have our clinical informatics team at NAC that is looking to update the crosswalk um, just to make sure that it's comprehensive. Um, and then sharing that with the EMR vendors that do have an active license agreement with, with Prepare. Um, and we are going to do more around that. We, it's just, it's slow going. And I think what I've heard from the field is that there's it's a lot of um, it's a lot of effort and not sure if they're going to get reimbursed yet or not is like a big thing that's really difficult. Um, so that's what I know. Sonia, I don't know if you have any other insights that you want to share with that. <laughs> yes. So we are um, we have updated the uh, prepare tool in our EHR, and so with doing that, there are some codes that are automatic. Um, that, that are automated. And we use that information, even though we um, are not being reimbursed, we do utilize that information to be able to track the CHW, uh, their work, as well as track the different um, alerts that are happening. We are also, um, I'm not sure how, uh, we, we all, I'm sorry, we have, um, a data warehouse that we are partnered with. And this is throughout uh, the state of Missouri. We utilize Azara Healthcare and um, they are able to pull different information from our EHR. And from that, we are able to see what um, the needs of our communities are, as well as we're able to provide information um, across the state for the different um, social determinants or social drivers of health. So we do utilize 
um, some of the codes, but again, it is automated. We don't put those codes in. Yeah. So hopefully that answered some questions. And, you know, once we have something more formalized around Z codes and billing, we'll let you all know. The prepare team also does have a tiger team we meet every three week on month every three weeks on Mondays. So check out the prepare website um, just to learn more about the upcoming sessions. And then you'll be able to sign up for any future sessions. But we know the Z codes and billing is like a big thing. Um, I'm just scanning to see any of the pre-submitted questions. Um, I guess here, um, I'm just scanning through to see which one makes sense. Um, so I guess with, and I know you touched on this a little bit, Sonia, but I guess when you do get pushback from, from patients on answering these questions, you know, how do you manage that? Um, I, that actually came up a little bit in some of the pre-submitted questions. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, sometimes finding a different way of asking a question will work. Um, and honestly, uh, building a rapport or building, starting to build that relationship, if you know you're going to see that patient, um, so take for instance, the prenatal patients, we know we're going to see you throughout your pregnancy. Um, if you decide not to answer a lot of the questions, that's fine. We'll take the information that we are able to get. Um, however, once we built that relationship with you, then we'll go back and ask those questions again. So for the prenatal team, um, they actually see those patients at the very beginning of their pregnancy and that prepare tool is completed. And then the prepare tool is also completed once they've delivered because we know they're gonna have different needs um, after, or we're thinking they're gonna have different needs after the, uh, they have delivered. Yeah, and that was the great thing about your recording and that it just kind of, it showed us how you saw and you acknowledged that she skipped the question, but then kind of went back to when it made more sense to maybe you know, ping her a little bit, not ping her, but just nudge a little bit to maybe answer the question. So I appreciate that. That yeah. technique. Um, so I think we're pretty much out of time. There were a couple more questions, um, but we'll be sure to, you know, answer them offline and send them to you all. Um, so this way, you know, if, if you have more questions, you know, let us know. But I think, Sonia, I can't thank you enough. You're amazing. You and your team are just phenomenal. We thank you for all of your efforts. Thank you very much. Hand over back to Elizabeth. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. That was such a fantastic presentation. As we reminded you folks again, this event was being recorded um, and will be available for playback. Of course, we'll send you a link to the recording as well as the slide deck um, for those active links. And um, of course, that prepare video, that demo video, we want to share that with you. So thank you for that. Thank you for such a, your lively conversation within the chat. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on a future NAC event. Have a great day at your health centers and wherever you're working from today. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.